All right, welcome everyone. My name is Prez, and in this chapter of DCS F-14 Tomcat for Dummies, we will be discussing the different air-to-air -air weapons currently available to the F-14 Tomcat in DCS. Something to note before we get into the lesson is that I will not be covering proper beyond visual range or within visual range combat tactics. We will simply be covering all the capabilities of all the different missiles available to the F-14A and B variants. I will leave proper tactics up to another video because tactics is something we could go on about for hours and hours. But for now, let's get to learning how these missiles actually work. Alright, let's get a little missile terminology out of the way. First, we'll start off with a bit of range terminology so you can effectively employ your missile in the future. The two most basic and important range terms to know are the NES and RMAX. The NES or No Escape Zone is a theoretical range at which an opponent will have little to no chance of kinetically defeating your missile shot if fired within this range. The only chance they have of defeating your missile is to outmaneuver the missile, hide behind cover via terrain masking, or spoof your missile with chaff or flares. Shots taken within this range can be considered kill shots as they have an extremely high probability to connect with the target. Next up is the RMAX or maximum range. This is the maximum theoretical range you can launch your missile and expect to hit a completely cooperative hot aspect target. Shots taken between the NES and RMAX can be referred to as what's called a posturing shot, but we'll get more into that when we talk about actually using the Tomcat in BVR engagements. Now, if you've heard missile terminology before, then you're probably wondering why I haven't brought up the MAR, or minimum abort range. The minimum abort range is a term used purely when talking about missile defense. Launching a missile outside of or within the MAR of any particular missile means nothing to you as the attacker, so we will not be covering it here. Before we move on to missile classifications, it's a good rule of thumb to remember that a missile's range effectively doubles every 20,000 feet in the air it's launched from. So, for example, let's say the maximum range of a missile at sea level is something like 5 nautical miles. That would mean that the same missile has a maximum range of 10 nautical miles up at 20,000 feet and 20 nautical miles up at 40,000 feet. It's a pretty easy rule of thumb to remember and can help you out when you first start memorizing missile ranges for combat. Alright, let's actually talk about missile classifications. The first type of missile to be aware of is the Semi-Active Radar Homing Missile, or SAR, generally known as a FOX-1. This type of missile requires the launching aircraft to acquire and maintain a single target track radar lock to guide the missile all the way until it impacts the target. If you lose lock, then the missile is basically dead. However, some FOX-1s have the ability to continue to guide if you reacquire a lock. The target aircraft will be given a missile launch warning the moment you launch a missile if they have a radar warning receiver. So it's important to keep that in mind when engaging opponents. The next type of missile to know is the Passive Infrared Guided Homing Missile, otherwise known as a FOX-2. These are also known as heat-seeking missiles or heaters, and for good reason. It's important to note that these missiles are passively guided because this means that obtaining a lock and launching this type of missile will not alert the target aircraft that they are being engaged. FOX-2 missiles require a large enough infrared or heat signature to obtain a lock and are therefore shorter range than radar guided missiles. Older generation FOX-2s were rear aspect only, meaning that they needed to be behind the target in order to acquire a lock as the exhaust from a jet engine is obviously greater behind than it is out in front. Newer generation FOX-2 missiles have the ability to engage from any angle, making them extremely deadly. The last type of missile to be aware of is the Active Radar Homing Missile, or ARH, otherwise known as a FOX-3. These types of missiles also require a radar lock, just like FOX-1 style missiles, although there is some nuance there as FOX-3s can utilize other forms of target tracking, such as TWS or track wall scan. Either way, FOX-3 missiles require guidance from the launching aircraft until the missile reaches a predefined range from the target in the missile's flight path, at which point the missile activates its own radar and is able to guide itself to target without help from the launching aircraft. Alright, with that out of the way, let's talk about the first missile, the classic AIM-9 Sidewinder. Thank you. 
Both the F-14A and F-14B have access to the AIM-9L or Lima, and the AIM-9M or Mike. The F-14 Tomcat is able to carry up to four AIM-9 Sidewinders. Two can be located on specialized AIM-9 rails on the glove pylons located here, and another two can be carried on the actual glove pylon as seen here. Both the AIM-9L and AIM-9M are all-aspect capable passive infrared guided missiles, otherwise known as FOX-2, with the ability to be launched up to 40 degrees off boresight when using the cage seam button. Both variants feature the same physical design and therefore behave the exact same in flight. Both missiles contain the same 21 pound warhead. Both variants also utilize the same roughly five second long rocket motor capable of propelling the missile at speeds in excess of Mach 2.5. However, the M variant differs in that its motor does not produce smoke unlike the L variant. The L and M variants also differ significantly in seeker performance. Where the L struggles to obtain a lock in lookdown situations, especially over land, the M fixes this issue. The M also provides better countermeasure resistance compared to the L. Now, when actually attempting to acquire a lock, the seeker automatically slaves to the AUG-9. However, you will notice that unless your target is around the ADL cross on the HUD, there will be no audible locking tone. The seeker is by default boresight locked. However, pressing your cage seam button illuminates the cage seam light on the ACM panel and unlocks the AIM-9's seeker head. You will notice at this point that the locking tone is significantly more audible and you can hear it while the target is far from the ADL cross. This is a solid lock tone, so you should make it common practice to immediately engage the cage seam button when switching to your sidewinders. Now, let's take a look at the actual ranges of the AIM-9 Sidewinder. This missile is far from a beyond visual range capable weapon. Now, these numbers aren't exact, but they are close enough, and it's a lot easier to remember than an exact number to the decimal. As we can see, the AIM-9 Sidewinder has an effective NES of 2 nautical miles and an R max of 6 nautical miles at sea level. These ranges of course double every 20,000 feet as you can see. A quick side note on the Sidewinder is that in the future the Tomcat may gain access to older rear aspect only variants of the Sidewinder when the Iranian F-14 model comes out, such as the Air Force AIM-9E, J, or even P variants, so keep that in mind for the future. Now, let's talk about the Humble Sparrow. The F-14 Tomcat is able to carry up to six AIM-7 Sparrows at once. Two can be located on the glove pylons as you can see here, and up to four can be mounted on special belly recesses located here. The AIM-7 Sparrow is a semi-active radar homing missile, or SAR, also known as a FOX-1. The AIM-7 Sparrow has the ability to be guided in both Pulse and Pulse Doppler single target track modes. The F-14A and F-14B both have the ability to carry the AIM-7F, AIM-7M, and AIM-7MH variants of the Sparrow missile. For all intents and purposes, the M and MH are exactly the same, however the MH has the ability to loft which theoretically gives the missile a higher effective range at altitude and slightly higher countermeasure resistance. Both the AIM-7F and AIM-7M variants of the Sparrow have the same dual stage rocket motor. The first stage is a 4.5 second long boost motor and the second stage is a significantly weaker sustained thrust motor lasting 11.5 seconds. This grants these variants the most range and heaviest warheads of any Sparrow iteration and a theoretical max speed of Mach 4, if you're lucky. But in reality, 
The Sparrow was made to cruise at around Mach 2.5. The F and M variants do slightly differ in warheads, however, where the F uses an 86 pound continuous rod warhead, the M uses an 88 pound blast fragmentation warhead. A very important difference to note is the seeker performance between the F and M variants. The F and its continuous wave seeker does just fine in co altitude and look up situations, however, can falter in look down situations due to its continuous wave seeker. This issue can be dealt with with the use of the Sparrow Pulse Doppler mode available to the Rio, but this drastically increases the missile's weakness to notching. The AIM-7M, on the other hand, has an improved seeker that utilizes an inverse monopulse seeker, which allows it to function better in look-down situations, as well as having improved countermeasure resistance. Both the M and F variants have the ability to home on jam, or HOJ, meaning even if you don't have a lock after firing, the target can still get hit if they are utilizing a jammer. So now, let's take a look at the ranges for this missile. To prep you for these numbers, the Sparrow is, well, a kinetically challenged missile, we'll say. So these numbers may or may not surprise you. The AIM-7F and AIM-7M variants of the Sparrow missile have a NES of approximately 2.5 nautical miles at sea level and a maximum effective range of about 10 nautical miles. Again, these ranges double every 20,000 feet as you can see. Now, if we're being honest, the Sparrow is frankly a pretty terrible missile, both in DCS and even in real life. The kinetic performance of the Sparrow leaves a lot to be desired. The Sparrow can get the job done, but don't expect it to do its job every time. However, don't take this info and completely disregard the Sparrow. The missile is quite impressive in a dogfight, and the psychological effect of being spiked by a Tomcat and seeing a smoke trail come off the airframe will send any pilot with a brain running for their life. Plus, you'll need to learn the Sparrow for Fox 1 engagements. It's a whole different type of combat compared to Fox 3s. A quick addition to note about the Sparrow is that in the future the Tomcat may gain access to both the AIM-7E and AIM-7P Sparrow variants. The E Sparrow is a lighter, older version with a worse motor and smaller 65 pound warhead. And the P is the most modern version of the Sparrow with a significantly upgraded seeker head for the missile. These are not currently implemented at the time of this video's publication, but it's good to be aware of for the future. Now, let's talk about the big boy. The one and only AIM-54 Phoenix missile. The F-14 Tomcat has the ability to carry up to six AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. Two Phoenix missiles can be located on the glove pylons here, while up to four can be mounted on specialized aerodynamic mounting stations located on the belly of the Tomcat. To preface the rest of this section, there is still a lot of work and fine tuning being done to the Phoenix in terms of guidance, flight profiles, countermeasure resistance, etc. So bear that in mind for the future. The AIM-54 Phoenix missile is currently available in three variations. The AIM-54A Mark IV 47, AIM 54A Mark 60, and AIM 54C Mark 47. The Mark number distinguishes the rocket motor variant utilized by the version of the missile. The AIM 54A Mark 47 is a 987 pound missile with a Mark 82 500 pound bomb or 135 pounds of actual explosive for a warhead with an analog seeker head and contains the heavy smoke producing Hercules Mark 47 Mod 0 rocket motor with a burn time of a lengthy 27 seconds, which allows this missile to achieve speeds in excess of Mach 4.5. However, historically these missiles were of substandard quality, which prompted the creation of the AIM-54A Mark 60. The AIM-54A Mark 60 Phoenix missile is the same as the AIM-54A Mark 47 variant, however it weighs slightly more at just about 1,040 pounds, and contains a slightly reduced smoke Aerojet Mark 60 rocket motor, which produces Produces about 10 to 15 percent more thrust with an increased burn time of 30 seconds, which allows the missile to achieve speeds in excess of Mach 5. 
Aerojet's contract would expire in 1978, halting all production of the Mark 60 motor, which is why we don't see a C variant with the Mark 60 motor. Finally, we have the AIM-54C Mark 47 Phoenix missile. This variant contained a new and very much improved all-digital seeker head, which allowed it to more reliably engage small targets at both extremely high and extremely low altitudes. The AIM-54C also contained a new blast fragmentation version of the 135-pound warhead and weighed roughly 1,026 pounds. The AIM-54C utilizes an improved smokeless Hercules Mark 47 mod 1 motor that produces roughly 5% more thrust with the same burn time of 27 seconds, which allows the missile to achieve speeds in excess of Mach 4.5. Now, let's talk about the Phoenix's actual behavior. There are some special quirks to be aware of with the AIM-54's guidance. The AIM-54 Phoenix is special in that it can behave as either a FOX-3 active radar homing missile or a FOX-1 semi-active radar homing missile. When using TWS, the Phoenix will be launched in active radar homing, or FOX-3 mode, which requires the AUG-9 to send a radio signal to command the missile to go active. The Phoenix does not go active on its own like an AIM-120 can. If you lose radar contact in TWS or turn cold before the missile goes active, consider it dead. Now, when using a single target track, the Phoenix will launch in semi-active or FOX-1 mode and will never go active. You must maintain lock until the missile or your radar is defeated or you hit the target. Now, when firing the M54 Phoenix missile within 21 nautical miles of a target, the missile will not loft whatsoever, and when launched within 10 nautical miles, it will come off the rail with the seeker already active, regardless of whether you are in STT or TWS. When firing the AIM-54 Phoenix missile at ranges exceeding 21 nautical miles, a loft profile is utilized that causes it to climb until it reaches 21 nautical miles from target, at which point it will make a turn to begin its terminal dive. So, upon trigger pull, it takes 3 seconds for the radar information to be sent to the missile, at which point you will hear a very audible thud, letting you know the missile has been launched. However, when launched in boresight mode, the missile will come off immediately active, and only takes at most 1 second before coming off the rail. The M54 Phoenix missile is only able to be guided in either Pulse Doppler single target track or in TWS as it utilizes Pulse Doppler. If you try to launch the missile with a Pulse track, it will simply come off the rail active and won't be guided by your radar. Radar. Here's a quick side note to make before we move on to the AIM-54 Phoenix's range numbers. While the A variant utilizes an inferior analog seeker and the C variant utilizes a far superior digital seeker, these discrepancies aren't currently modeled at the time of this video's publication. Now, let's talk about the AIM-54's range capabilities. The AIM-54 Mark 47 variants have a NES of roughly 7 nautical miles and a max range of about 20 nautical miles at sea level. And of course, this doubles every 20,000 feet. Now, what about the Mark 60's range? Well, at sea level, the Mark 60 has a NES of around 9 nautical miles and a max range of about 25 nautical miles. And, again, this more or less doubles every 20,000 feet. I don't think it needs to be said, but the AIM-54 Phoenix missile has the most impressive range capabilities in DCS until we see something like the Meteor missile from the Eurofighter come out. But besides that, you more than outrange your opponents in most scenarios. Alright. So this concludes our chapter on the Tomcats missiles. I hope this information will be able to stick with you and was easy to understand. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments section. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and share this video with a friend. And if you want to see more, then click the subscribe button. It is very much appreciated. Next time on the DCS F-14 Tomcat for Dummies series, we will be going over how to actually fight with the F-14 Tomcat so that not only do you know what the weapons do, but you also know how to use them. With that all being said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching and have a nice day.